Hey, Gray Stallman here. It's Friday. Once again, the Doctors In Live with TOA is on and going. As you can see, I have another guest this week. This is Dr. Martha George, and um, we're going to be talking to Martha a little bit about kind of the psychological aspects of orthopedic injuries. Um, she comes at it from a high level athlete's point of view, sports medicine point of view, and I think it's going to be really helpful because I personally have had. Uh, amateur athletic injury that have really messed with me and changed the way I approach sports and athletics and so I think um, a lot of people have had that. Um, as always, um, please remember that the information we're going to talk about today is for your information, it's for educational purposes, maybe a little entertainment, but we are not your orthopedic surgeons. This is not considered medical advice even though we're both board certified orthopedic surgeons. So. Please, if you have a problem, if you have a, a concern, musculoskeletal, orthopedic, bone, muscle, joint problem, uh, why don't you go to toa.com. Uh, you can learn about us, you can learn about the practice as a whole, you can learn about our services, our locations, what we do, um, and get yourself taken care of face-to-face, -face, or you can visit with somebody online if you want to. We're also doing telemedicine visits still, um, which Frankly, I love doing, I do those every Friday morning because uh, I can actually see people from a, a, a gazillion miles away and still take care of them. So it's a, it's a nice thing for me. Uh, but go to toa.com and uh, uh, get an appointment. You can actually make an appointment online on our website. Uh, the telemedicine visit information is also on our website, so take a look. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Martha George. Uh, Dr. George is a relatively new physician with TOA, but that doesn't mean she's not been in practice for a while. She's actually, we stole her away from uh, uh, a practice uh, locally. We're glad to have her. And uh, Martha, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Right. Tell these guys a little bit about yourself and then let's get into our topic. All right, well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy for the chance to work for TOA. I'm loving it so far. Um, I'm actually from Alabama, from Montgomery, Alabama. Um, I grew up there. Um, I went to a little private school there. I then ended up getting a softball scholarship to play at Auburn University. Um, I was a four-year starter there, and then I ended up at uh, medical school at UAB, and I stayed in Birmingham for about 11 years. I did my residency there, and then I did a sports fellowship with the Andrews Sports Medicine Group there. Um, after that, I took a job in Alabama um, for a little bit and then came to Tennessee and then, like I said, kind of got stolen over to the TOA side, which I'm, I'm happy for. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of competitive sports since I left playing softball in college, but I do like to, you know, I ride horses, uh, I still I have a Peloton, I love getting on that. I'm very competitive just in a, in a um, by nature, so um, it still comes pretty pretty natural to me. So your Peloton experience must be yeah. a little scary sometimes. So uh, if it. you're that competitive, so it. obviously um, D1 level athlete. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you told me you were a pitcher Correct. to start, and then you Correct. had an injury. Yes, and things changed in your sports life, right? Yes, yeah. very much so. And um, I think that segues well into our topic today, which again we wanted to talk a little bit about the psychological aspects right. of sports injuries, and we can uh, branch that out to just orthopedic injuries in general, because general people who are not athletes do have um, emotional effects of their injuries and lifestyle changes, just like athletes do. It's just I think athletes have a little bit more critical. It's, it's a bigger swing in yes. many cases. Yes. So give me your thoughts about um, how important the whole psychological side of things to a musculoskeletal or orthopedic injury is for folks. Um, it's huge. You know, people don't really think about the mental aspects of things, um, but it's, I would say it's a good 70%, if not more, of the recovery phase for an injury, no matter who you are. I always tell my patients, you know, okay, so this is the injury you have, this is the recovery. Um, you know, you may think, oh, okay, that's doable right now, but it never really hits you until you're in the middle of that recovery. And then you're like, oh my gosh, why did I do this? You know, and then <laughs> there's usually that time frame where it just kind of, everything takes a turn and everything's getting better and you're happy that you, you know, you got it fixed or you, you did what you needed to do to get back out there. But that, that especially the, when the recovery is prolonged, that mental aspect of getting over that is, is just huge. So what's some of the advice that you give folks to try to help them make it through and you know everything from just the decision of surgery or treatment 
to recovery. And then also the bigger picture for the more um, active folk, um, how do you get back to your lifestyle after all that block of time you've kind of lost? How, what are some advice that you work with people on their kind of mental side of things? Right. Well, so when they come in with an injury and we're trying to decide, you know, there's some injuries where you, you have this injury, you absolutely need to, you have to get a fix. There's no, there's no real choice. Um, but there's others where we try conservative and maybe that doesn't work and they're thinking, gosh, I want to have this fixed. I know I'll get better. I just don't want to take that time out of my, my life. And what you have to understand is I, I walk them through that and I say, okay, well, let's continue down this road you're going. Um, you get three months, six months down from now, now you really have to have it fixed. And now we're, wait, we're, we're going a whole nother three to six months. So you have to think about it in a daily you know, aspect of your life. Okay, so if I take this time now, I can get better and I'll be back to myself you know, three, six months down the road instead of waiting it out and trying, you know, trying to hope that it goes away and then starting back over all, you know, again. Yeah, um, my practice and talking with some of the other folks that have been on uh, this uh, show, if you will, um, we've always talked about, you know, it takes time to get over an injury or a particularly surgery. And in many cases, it can take a year yes. to get to your new normal. And people have to be not only prepared for treatment being hard and dedicated, you have to be dedicated to it, but also I think people have to be aware that it's not an instant fix. Yeah. And um, so if you're already kind of down and out emotionally because you've lost your lifestyle, I can only imagine what it's like to lost my lifestyle, plus it's gonna, you mean it's gonna be a year, doctor? Yeah. And so to your point, um, delaying or waiting, hoping that it will go away, um, it can just make it an even longer process. So when people are really discouraged, when people are um, uh, having trouble, um, what do you want them to do? I just want to take it a day at a time, and that's that's really big in athletes. So you know, at, we as athletes, we're we're very competitive. We're that go go go. I want to get back. I want to do this. I want to do this. And but a lot of times. And this is one place where you have to step back and not look at the big picture. Let's take it, you know, one day at a time, one week at a time. What's my goal for this day? What's my goal for this week? Because if you get the big picture in mind and you look at that six-month process from an ACL recovery or nine months or whatever it is, or even sometimes a year, you get overwhelmed. And so the best way to, to do it is to say, okay, this week, this is what your goal is. This is where we're getting. If you reach that goal, great. If not, we're still working on it. But this is your goal for today, this is your goal for this week, this is your goal for this month, not this is my goal for six months from now. So if you just take it as a step-by-step -step process, people can they, can, they can handle that a lot better, they can understand that a lot better, and it makes for a better recovery. So before we came on the air, you were telling me a little bit about your softball history. Tell me about your injury, a little bit, if you can, yeah. too, okay. and kind of what uh, happened there, because I know there were definitely some changes in your pathway yes. um, after you started having trouble, right? Yes, it did. So when I was a junior in high school, I dove back into third base and collided with the third baseman. Um, knee immediately swe swelled up, you know, significant pain, trouble weight bearing, you know, all the things you think of, gosh, is this ACL, you know, something like that. Um, ended up getting diagnosed with something different. Um, however, it was my plant leg as a pitcher, and so I never really felt like I was stable. Um, when I came back to pitching. I did finish out pitching in high school. I was still recruited as a pitcher, but I ultimately changed pathways. Um, and that's the good thing about being a utility player is I was able to do something else. Um, so I played short and third in college and ultimately let me hit, which was great because I loved hitting. So if I'd have been a pitcher, I wouldn't have gotten to hit, most likely, most pitchers don't. So in all actuality, it, it became a positive thing for me. Um, I still look back and say, gosh, I wish I had been able to, I wish I'd have been able to, to progress as a pitcher because I feel like I would have you know, done great. But at the same time, there, there was a positive aspect to it. But it was definitely a mental thing as well. You know, when you get told about baseball and softball are the ones that I use because when I was coming up, everybody was like, well, you know, baseball and softball are 75, 80, 90% mental, and the rest, the little bit left, is your actual athletic ability. And that is so incredibly true. It may be, you know, more 60, 40, 70, 30, but it's definitely a huge part of it. And if I could go back and play softball in college with the mentality I have now from what I've learned, it would be a whole different ballgame for sure. But it sounds like um, because of your experience, mm -hmm. you're actually a different and probably a more well-rounded person, particularly being a sports medicine type of doctor, right. than you would have been had you ever, you'd been completely durable. Correct. Yeah. Most, yeah, most likely. And I actually, and, and I think it's good for me with my patients because I've been there. I've, I've done that. I know what it's like to rehab. I know what it's like to come back. 
and still have that fear of re-injury or that not necessarily the mental capacity to return to play when I should have had it. Um, and that's huge. When you look at injuries in athletes, you know, we've done some research on that, um, the psychological effects, that, that readiness to return to play, the psychological readiness, and then the fear of re-injury is huge into whether they make it back to, to pre-injury level. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of injuries like, you know, slap lesions, the labral lesions in the shoulders and, and ACLs where there's a good number of people who won't make it back to their pre-injury level. And I think a large majority of that is here. And is that, is that also true in just the average person? Yes. Um, I, I would imagine it seems to be those types of studies are really looking at the elite athlete level, mm -hmm. which have a, there's a fine difference between how they feel sure. and their performance big broader level of performance in the average amateur athlete and a much broader um, swing of performance in the average person. But right. that doesn't mean that the average person can't feel that loss, right? Right, correct, 100%. Because they have, you know, I get women all the time who have kids and I can't, I can't pick up my kid. I can't, you know, I can't do what I need to do throughout the day and that's so debilitating to them. And I get that also being a mother. Um, that's hard not being able to do the things that you you want to do outside of just your job I mean, we can type on a keyboard and we can do things like that But but actually the day-to-day -day activities that make you who you are are tough sometimes when you're when you're battling an injury or recovering from surgery Yeah, the I would imagine that the loss mm -hmm. of What your well-being is what your personal view of yourself Correct. where you should be where you want to be um, It can be really hard for people. I mean as I was telling you before, um, you know, I used to do a lot of triathlon and, mm -hmm. and tore a ligament in my foot, and that was the downhill spiral of going from lots of activity to essentially zero activity for years for me, and it really did mess with me. I mean, I used to love riding my bike, and during that period of time, I didn't want to look at my bike. Right. Um, I found my love for my bike again. Unfortunately, now I'm 59, so <laughs> my body doesn't work like it used right, to. Right. But, um, you know, that sense of loss. I see a lot of patients, you know, um, far different kind of thing, not a specific injury, you know, um, in my practice with older patients, degenerative changes, yes. and their brain's working great, their body's not working so great. Right. And there's truly a sense of loss of, I want to be like I used to be. Mm -hmm. And while we can't oftentimes make people the way they used to be, particularly in that situation, we can certainly try to help get them closer. Right. And people can enjoy and be fulfilled, I think, with um, uh, their lives if they can kind of change their mindset a little bit too. So I would imagine, speak to that a little bit about, yes. you know, are there expectations in musculoskeletal care that while we may not be able to get you back to the way you were, it can still be good. Yes, there are. I have a lot of patients who, you know, like yours, come in and they're, I think their expectations are a little bit unrealistic. So they're thinking, okay, so they're, you know, I, I treat a lot of middle-aged patients with rotator cuff tears or, you know, even ACLs, um, meniscal injuries, you know, things to that effect. And they come in and their expectation is, I want to be back like I'm 30. And I can't, you, we're not miracle workers. We can't do that. You know, as we age, we can't go back to where we were either. I mean, I've lost a few steps. I'd love to be back where I was when I was a teenager, you know, but that's never going to happen. Wait turn 59. Yeah, I know, I hear, I hear. I heard it's all downhill from 40, but, you know, um, to each his own. So, but it, it's that type of perspective. Like, so when you when they do undergo these things, you have, you have to stay on the front end because their mentality pre-surgery and early, immediate, like early post surgery and early recovery is is key to getting them through it so you have to say look you may never be a hundred percent you may never be what you were when you were younger but I can get you back to very functional and I can take away your pain a lot of times um, and that's the whole point of these surgical procedures so if they go into it saying okay I'm realistic I know that I'm not going to be you know maybe not be completely pain-free or may not have the range of motion exactly like I had before this or back 20 years ago um, they're very happy with they're very satisfied you know, with the, with the procedure and with the recovery. Yeah, and uh, um, to your point as well, I think part of the success mm -hmm. to your helping somebody is not only that preparation, but it's also engaging the patient in their recovery, their rehab and the recuperation. Uh, because if, if you don't do the work, you're not gonna get where you need to be no matter what, right? Right. right. Uh, and particularly, with you, knees and shoulders, right? They're they're kind of picky joints, yes. Uh, and there's not a lot of room. If you if you're off a little bit, you feel off a lot. Yes. 
Um, and so the rehab is actually really probably the most important, a good operation, but the rehab is really the key to the best outcome. Is that right? Yes, I tell them that every single time we do something. I say, I, can, I do my part, that's a small amount. You have to do your part, and then therapy. I mean, I, I stress therapy so much. A good therapist, a good trainer for a kid coming back to sport, they can, they can make or break the deal. And so, ultimately, it's on the patient yes. and taking personal responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So you mentioned kids. Do you take care of any teens, kids, young people in your current practice? I do. I see a lot. I don't have a physical team myself. We're working on that. Um, but I do take care of a lot of athletes, a lot of high school kids, a lot of um, college kids. Um, and they, that, they're the biggest group that you really have to work on the mentality of things because they're not you know a lot of them are not as you know mature they haven't lived they haven't experienced they're only living in their world right now and their world can be football baseball softball and and it is and that's you know that's great because it teaches a lot of good things Mm -hmm. but they also have to realize that you know okay this injury today is not going to make or break me as a person as a human um, and it's also something that I can get over. And if I take the right steps, if I do it correctly, if I work hard, if I take it one day at a time, one step at a time, if I don't get overwhelmed, um, then it's something that I can definitely manage and I can overcome. And it certainly seems in this day and age with certain sports, football in particular, I can see basketball probably, baseball probably, the, the pro sports. Right. That there's an increasing kind of uh, feeling that, oh my God, I have an opportunity to be a professional athlete. And kids need to understand that there aren't very many NFL football players. There aren't very many basketball players. There are more baseball players, but there's a lot of baseball players who never make it to the major leagues or even the major minor leagues. Um, So it's a little bit of perspective, I think, in those kids, right? Yes, very much so. I mean, first and foremost, it's you need to be get you back to being a person you want to be, and if we can get you to that level, we're going to do everything we can to try. Yes, and we really have to focus on self esteem. They get there when you have an injury, especially as an elite athlete, um, the self esteem drops because they're like, well, this is what defined me. You know, now I can't do it, and will I ever be able to do it again? And and like I said, that like. Going at, at them on that level and getting to that first and then you know, doing, fixing the injury, fixing the problem along the way, um, tackling both of those is, is really beneficial at getting them back to everything they want to do. With the um, explosion of girls and young women's organized sports, team sports, yes. and recognition of such, and also our recognition that men male, female bodies are different yes. and there's different injury patterns and stuff like that. Have you seen a change? Because you've been around now for a while. Have you mm-hmm. seen a change in, you know, it used to be all boys, right. sports injuries, a change in the injuries, particularly sports, male to female? Um, I see a lot of both, actually. Um, there's a lot of overhead sports, you know, like there's volleyball for girls and they, there's, I mean, there is volleyball for boys, but you just don't see as many right. as you do in, in females. And so they can get the same overhead injuries like baseball players because they're constantly, you know, doing that overhead motion and it, and it, it half forces. Um, and so I see a lot of shoulder injuries in volleyball players. I still see a lot of shoulder injuries in softball players as well, especially if they're throwing a lot, catchers, things like that, um, outfielders. Um, and then there is obviously, and, and most people know this in the sports world, but there's, there's a higher um, risk of injury of ACL for females. And there's a lot of things that I just, um, I have a TOA tips video that's coming out about that, or I think it already came out, about the differences in females versus males for that aspect of what we have to do as females to try to prevent, to be preventative there. Um, things like neuromuscular training, really working on the hamstrings, learning how to land your jumps, balance, things like that, that men have a, have a little bit easier than, than women do, and so we have to work a little bit harder. Um, and it's easier for a couple reasons, I think, right? Um, one, their anatomy is a little bit different, yes. so they baseline are less at risk. Yes. They have different uh, muscle strength and different tone. Correct. But they've also been the focus. Correct. Um, and women, young girls, women, are now coming into their own. Unfortunately, it's been this long. I'm yeah. 59, and this should be a lot long past. But, you know, we see a lot more girls playing sports, a lot yes. more high-level girls playing high-level sports, yes. um, high school, college, and now professional women's leagues and stuff like that. That um, I mean, heck, the women's soccer team is, what, one of our winningest teams yes. internationally ever? They are. Um, they and are. We, unfortunately, we've not really recognized that. And so it really is important to remember that girls and boys are different. Correct. And um, and we can't train them the same. We can't work them the same. 
but boy, they can be as good or better than each other um, in their athletic endeavors, right? Yes, very much so. Yeah, the women, the sports that women have now is, it's pretty amazing what we can do. Yeah. What, what they can do. Well, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, don't Again, we're turning <laughs> <laughs> But uh, um, so um, that's awesome. That's a great topic to start off with. I think it certainly applies to general population as well. Where I did my residency, the the head of the sports medicine division who came in, came to Vanderbilt when I was on that rotation made it a point to say everybody is treated like an athlete. Some people are just higher level athletes than others. And so he really brought the same type of data and treatment to average Joe or yes. Josephine that he did to the college level ball players and the professionals. And it made a difference. Yes. Um, and I think so we're actively treating people all the time more equally than we used to. Yes. And then if you, even as a sports, you know, fellowship training physician, if you don't go to somewhere that um, is pretty special where you just get athletes, you just get, you know, under this certain age population, you're going to see the, the general population of people that have injuries that are similar to your athletes. So you're going to need to be able to, to um, address those in both populations and to be able to speak to them in different, in different languages that ultimately get you the same end result. Um, I have a, a lady who um, had an ACL tear. Um, she had had an ACL tear, I think, like maybe two, three years ago, and it was fixed. And then she was like, when she came in, she's like, I just know I did it. I know I did it again. I was like, okay, well, let's just calm down. Let's get the MRI. You know, you're really guarded. It's hard for me to really tell on exam, so let's get it. Of course, she had done it. She's like, and she just started bawling. She was like, it's just so hard. It's just so long. It's just, you know, the recovery is, is just so tough. And I was like, okay. I get it. You know, I've never been in that situation. I've never had my ACL reconstructed, but but I'm here with you. Let's walk through this. It's, let's take it one day at a time, and we will get you back to doing everything you want to do. And uh -huh. that just comforted her. I think that's a great mantra, one day at a time. Bring, right. You know, it, it can be overwhelming for anybody going through any of this stuff yes. um, uh, to look at the big picture, as you said, and, and take it as a whole. And so one day at a time, one week at a time, take yes. the small wins, um, yes, our, our marathon not a sprint mentality is really right. what we need to be thinking about in the recovery. So yes. I think that applies everywhere. Yes, 100%, just in life in general. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> wait till you're 59. Um, that should be the title of this uh, episode. I'm super excited to get there. <laughs> you're making it look so appealing. Hey, I'll tell you, 59 has been great. Um, uh, any last thoughts? Anything you'd like to mention? Uh, uh, anything that you're particularly interested in? Um, as far as in your professional career, your personal career, and, and personal life, anything like that? Um, no, I just, you know, I think the mantra of take it one day at a time, at a time applies to all of us. You know, having changed to a new practice, I'm somewhat starting over again, so it's tough for me. I'm a very impatient person, and so I'm like, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to get going, and I have to take a step back, and it's one day at a time. Um, and I think that's just, just such a great mentality to have, because if you do that, you can overcome anything. And where are you seeing patients? Which offices? Um, I'm in the Lebanon office, um, as well as the Mount Juliet office. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently, which hospitals or facilities are you working at? Uh, I work at Vanderbilt Wilson County in Lebanon, as well as Summit um, in Hermitage. And then I operate at the Summit Surgery Center, the Providence Surgery Center in Mount Juliet, and then the Vanderbilt Wilson County Surgery Center. Oh, so well, for you all people, the Vanderbilt University's Medical Center was University Medical Center in Lebanon. <laughs> and then Tanova. Yeah, and then Tanova. Tanova. That's, right. That's right. Anyway, well, cool. Thank you yeah. so much. No um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it as well. And uh, I tell you, we're really looking forward to you blossoming in, in TOA's world. I think it'll be a great relationship. And we're so really too. looking forward to you um, just knocking it out of the park. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm ready. Pitch a, pitch a strike. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think that we'll call it a day. Um, uh, again, anything you want to know about uh, with regard to musculoskeletal care, go to toa.com uh, online. Casey, do we have any uh, questions? I think we're good. Okay, so Casey says we can go have lunch. Um, <laughs> so um, again, everybody uh, be smart, be kind to one another, wear a mask. We don't know what's happening with this virus stuff. It's not a political thing. It's a public health problem. Let's be patient with one another. Let's um, uh, be a little bit uh, more responsible to each other and ourselves. 
we'll get through this. Uh, we always will. And um, the weekend's supposed to be nice this weekend. So why don't you go out there and live your best life?